here. The session will last 45 minutes. Uh, there's going to be one talk for 20 minutes, um, 15 minutes, I'm sorry, and then um, five spotlights. Um, the first talk, uh, the authors won the Outstanding New Directions Award uh, that's now going to be presented by Bob Williamson, who is chairing the committee. Thank you. Um, on behalf of NEUROPE's 2019, I'm very proud to present the Outstanding New Directions Paper Prize Award to Vaishnav Nagarajan and Zico Kolta for their paper, Uniform Convergence, May Be Unable to Explain Generalization in Deep Learning. Please join me in congratulating the authors. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, Vaishnav will present the paper. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to my talk. So what's this paper about? One of the biggest open challenges central to deep learning theory is that of the generalization puzzle. Standard learning theory suggests that models that have many, many more parameters than training data points should not really generalize well. And yet, heavily over-parameterized deep networks have continued to give state-of-the-art generalization performance. What explains this counterintuitive behavior? Now, theoretical works have tried to crack this puzzle by deriving upper bounds on the generalization gap of upper bounds on the generalization gap of deep networks. And crucially, all these bounds are based on a single, uh, m most of these bounds are based on a single learning theoretic tool called uniform convergence. Now, despite a lot of work in this space, a tight generalization bound has so far been elusive. So in light of this, in our paper, we take a step back and we argue that this high level research direction of pursuing uniform convergence-based generalization bounds in deep learning may not really give us a full understanding of the solution to the generalization puzzle. So that's the high-level message of the paper. And in this talk, I'll first go over some background work quickly, and then I will present to you our two main findings, which are limitations of uniform convergence-based bounds. So what do we know about uniform convergence in the context of deep learning until before this work? So we look at uniform, uh, the definition of uniform convergence a lot more formally later in the talk. But at a high level, this is what these bounds do. These bounds take the set of all functions or hypotheses that can be, comp uh, that can be realized by a deep network. And then they compute some notion of complexity of this whole set of functions. Now, a deep network is a really expressive model, and therefore, these bounds become really loose. Or to be more precise, the numerator here grows with a parameter count, and that's going to be larger than the denominator in the over-parameterized regime, and hence lead to a vacuous bound. Now, how do we address this? The solution that was proposed was to refine these uniform convergence bounds by taking into account the implicit bias of the training algorithm, that is, SGD. That means we should somehow ignore extraneous functions in this function class and instead focus on a much smaller relevant part of the function class and compute bo the bounds accordingly. And the hope was that this would yield tighter bounds that do not grow with the parameter count and would instead depend on some appropriate notion of complexity that, that grows with certain weight norms in the network that are implicitly controlled by SGD, like distance from initialization, spectral norms, and so on. Now this proposal triggered a huge line of exciting works that have tried to refine uniform convergence bounds in many different ways using many different tools like Rademacher complexity, PacBase, and so on. Now, all these works provide a lot of intuition about generalization in deep learning, and they all explain generalization in certain aspects. However, unfortunately, each of these bounds also fail to explain generalization in other aspects. Either these bounds are too large or grow with the parameter count, unlike the actual generalization gap, or these are small, or the ones that are small or non-vacuous hold only on a modified network. They do not hold on the original network learned by SGD, but they require certain kinds of modifications like compression, ex explicit regularization, randomization, and so on. 
So in light of this, we want to take a step back and understand the limitations of uniform convergence bounds. And here's our first finding, which is an empirically observed limitation of uniform convergence. In most hyperparameter configurations in deep learning, you'd observe that as you increase the number of training data points, the generalization gap improves. It decreases with the training set size, and that's expected. But what is, surprise, what is surprising is that there are certain hyperparameter configurations where even though the generalization gap decreases with training set size, you would observe that existing generalization bounds increase with training set size in complete contrast to that. Now, what's really surprising about this is that this increase is observed even though the denominator here contains a training set size term. And that's, and that's because the numerator here contains certain weight norms that increase quite drastically with the training set size. Now, we present many other related observations in the paper, but the main point that I want to highlight for this talk is that we've all been focusing on deriving generalization bounds that have improved parameter count dependence. But looking ahead, it's also important to derive bounds that simultaneously satisfy at least a reasonable dependence on the training set size, because that's an equally important, uh, uh, that's an equally fundamental aspect of generalization that we should be able to capture to be able to fully understand generalization and deep learning. Now, th this is our first finding, which is an empirical limitation. Now, one might wonder, is it possible to somehow refine uniform convergence bounds very cleverly so that we can, some, we can surpass all these uh, empirical issues with uniform convergence. And to that, we present, to that hope, we present our second finding, which is a provable failure of uniform convergence. Specifically, we show that there are certain situations in deep learning where any uniform convergence bound, in whatever manner you try to define it, however clever you are, Will, pro will probably fail to explain generalization in those settings. So what do I mean by that? In these settings, even though the generalization gap will be really, really small, any refined uniform convergence bound will be vacuous and hence fail to explain why the network generalized well. So this is, our, this is the main uh, outline of our findings. So how exactly do we show this? A key element in our proof is the notion of a tightest uniform convergence bound that we introduce, which we eventually show is vacuous. Now, to understand what we mean by this, let's quickly go over some basic definitions. Given a training set S, let's say the algorithm learns a function H subscript S that fits the training set to zero error. Then with high probability over the draws of the training set, I, we have that the generalization gap upper bounds the difference between the test error and the empirical error on the data set S for the specific hypothesis H, uh, for the specific hypothesis that you learned on that data set. In other words, this is the difference between the test error and the training error. Now to upper bound this, we can turn to a naive conventional uniform convergence bound, which is essentially the difference between the test error and the empirical error taken uniformly across all hypotheses in the hypothesis class. Now, we know that this is a really loose quantity in deep learning, and we want to refine it. Uh, we want to refine it by excluding extraneous hypotheses from the hypothesis class. And we could do that in many different ways. For example, we could consider an L2 norm-bounded ball that contains all the relevant hypotheses, or an L1 norm-bounded ball that contains all hypotheses. But to get the tightest uniform convergence bound, we want to exclude all irrelevant hypotheses from the hypothesis class, and instead, focus on a most refined hypothesis class, which we will call as H star. And this class has those and only those hypotheses that your given algorithm would learn from data sets drawn from the given data distribution. And this excludes all other irrelevant hypotheses. Now, having defined this sort of a really small refined hypothesis class, you can think of a uniform convergence bound defined on this small set and such a bound would be tighter than any other refined uniform convergence bound that you can come up with. And then, having defined this in our work, in, we show that in certain settings, even this tightest bound will be vacuous. And therefore, all other refined uniform convergence bounds also become vacuous in these settings. Now, so how do we show that? In what, settings do we sh in what setting do we show that this sort of failure occurs? <clears throat> 
So we consider a binary classification task with two uh, concentric hyperspheres, and you want to separate the inner hypersphere from the outer hypersphere. And these hyperspheres are very close to each other, but then there's no label noise, and therefore they are perfectly separable. Now we train, we, we, we take random data drawn uniformly from, the, from these two hyperspheres, and we train a ReLU network using SGD, and we observe that as we increase the number of training data points, the generalization gap improves as expected. Now to show failure of uniform convergence, there are two key steps. First, we take each training data point, and then we project it onto the opposite hypersphere, and we change the label of the data point to the label that corresponds to the opposite hypersphere. And then we take the set of all projected data points and call it the data set S prime. Now this is the first step. And the second step is to show that the, and the second key step is to show that S prime is completely misclassified by the neural network, even though S prime is a valid data set under the given data distribution. In other words, your network com correctly classifies the training set S, it correctly classifies most random test data points, but it miserably fails on S prime. And intuitively, this can happen only if, you, if the boundary that you have learned has memorized certain skews around each training data point, and these skews are what cause the misclassification of the projected version of the training data points, as visualized in, in the graphic there. Now, what we show uh, what, what, what this means is that the le learned decision boundary is inherently quite complex, and we then mathematically show that this sort of complexity implies that even the most refined uh, hypothesis class that we saw a couple of slides ago, even that hypothesis class is quite complex, there, thereby rendering all uniform convergence bounds to be, to be vacuous. Now, this is the proof outline. Uh, taking a step back, the main takeaway here is that the decision boundary learned by deep networks on overparametrized, uh, uh, learned by SGD on overparametrized deep networks is inherently quite complex. And this complexity limits uniform convergence bounds from explaining why they generalize well. And this complexity does not really hurt generalization. Now, uh, in conclusion, we cast suspicion of, uh, on uniform convergence bounds to be able to explain generalization in deep learning. We saw that they increase with training set size. And we, so we saw that they probably fail in certain situations. But looking ahead, we believe it's important to mathematically understand the kind of complexities in the decision boundaries and to explore other learning theoretic tools. Or most excitingly, we could even derive new learning theoretic tools using our negative examples, like the hypersphere example, as test cases. But more broadly, we believe it's important to go beyond uniform convergence to crack the generalization puzzle. Thank you. Um, we have time for some questions. There are microphones, if you want to ask one. Um, could the spotlight presenters line up here? Uh, Shai. OK. So I mean, my first question is that you know, there's this famous paper of Moritz Hart and Ben Recht and some others that did something very similar on Amnist. They add random labels in the training time and the model fit perfectly in the training time and failed, of course, to generalize. So we already know for this paper that uh, generalization bounds of uniform convergence will not work because we know that deep neural networks learn MNIST very well. We know that it completely fails. I mean, it's like your experiment, but on real data. And once you show this failure, you know that the approach of, deep, of uh, uniform convergence will not work. So we know it for a few years already by very convincing uh, experimental evidence. And my other question is about how general your result could be. If you say any uniform convergence will fail, maybe my hypothesis space contains only the correct classifier, the exact correct classifier, and there, of course, I have uniform convergence. OK, uh, so if I understand the first question, it refers to what we knew about uniform convergence in the past. And I could potentially clarify this uh, offline, but 
my clarification would be that what we knew was that when we apply uniform convergence on the whole class of functions represented by a deep network, then that would be vacuous. And, be because, uh, and, the, and what we hoped was that if we could refine this function class, we can derive better bounds. And that is exactly what hundreds of papers have been doing over the last couple of years. So if it was obvious that uniform convergence would fail, then this direction would is, al is already sort of pointless, right? But, so it wasn't really clear that uniform convergence would fail if we were to cleverly apply it on a smaller function class. And our paper says that there are situations where even if you were to cleverly refine it, uniform convergence would fail. Um, but yeah, I can clarify this offline if that, was, that didn't answer your question. Uh, could you re remind me again what your other question No, no, but to the, to the first question, I mean, we know that the, uh, deep networks work perfectly well on MNIST. I, I apologize, Shai. We only have three minutes for questions. Okay. Uh, can we let someone else ask a question before we move on to the spotlights? Okay. I'm sorry about that. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Over here. Okay. Thanks. Uh, really cool talk. I'm just Thanks. wondering about this picture with the two hyperspheres. Um, you show that there are like these little wiggles, but I'm wondering if those are actually, you know, maybe those go all the way into the center of the sphere or out to infinity as opposed to just cupping around the points. Have you looked at that? Because that's kind of yeah, what okay. I would naively expect. Uh, so uh, th this is just a cartoon, and you can look at the exact picture in our paper. Um, so. They don't look exactly like this. It's a lot. The, the skew is a bit smoother, first of all, and the sec and secondly, they don't go all the way to the center. They, uh, nor do they go all the way to infinity. They, you can see these sort of bulges around the boundary, uh, along the planes that contain the training data points. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, uh, champion one of uh, Boston Data Science. First, a comment and a quick question. And the comment is that uh, the f I agree with the conclusion of uh, your research that uh, of, uh, generalization needs to take into account of uh, dependence on the distribution of that set. And uh, there are plenty of work on, uh, in this direction, uh, as uh, Shar mentioned earlier. The question here is uh, it, uh, regarding how you prove, uh, how you construct H star, the hypothesis class. And for uniform convergence to hold, the hypothesis class cannot see the data. But if you apply SDG first, you must see the data. So there's a contradiction. In the other words, you can't con construct H star before seeing the data. You must have a hypothesis class that doesn't, that holds for all the distributions. If you want to hold, have edge uh, start constructed based on data, you have to run through all the possible probability distributions. Thank you. Yep. OK, so I, I guess this is sort of a technical question about how we define the most refined hypothesis class. So this, uh, I might not be able to explain that in just w in, in a minute. But the high level idea here is that um, we assume so when you when you derive an actual upper bound on the uniform on uniform convergence, there you have many restrictions as to how you can go about uh, defining the hypothesis class. But here we assume that the person who is deriving the uniform convergence bound has access to the underlying data distribution, and so they can they they have all the power in the world to tighten the uniform convergence bound as much as possible. And we show that even in this best case, uniform convergence is going to fail. So. Uh, if you were to add these additional restrictions that you were talking about, uh, your bound is only going to be more vacuous. So that's the high-level idea. But yeah, I can, I, I'll be happy to clarify the technical details in person over the poster. But in theory, Thanks. H star can't be constructed without seeing the data. I'm sorry, we're really super late. Um, thank you. Yeah. Let's thank the speaker again. OK, we'll now move to the spotlights, five spotlight presentations. Um, yes, let's start. 
OK, uh, so let's get started. And uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Today I will talk about uh, exact computation with an uh, infinitely wide neural network. And this is joint work with uh, Sanjeev Arora, Simon Du, uh, Wei Hu, uh, Zhi Yuan Li, Ruslan Salakudinov, and I'm Rose Wang from Carnegie Mellon University. OK, so uh, recently there's a line of research uh, showing that neural networks uh, uh, that are sufficiently large can achieve zero training loss by just using great descent. So these works are done by Li and Liang, Du et al., Alan Zhu et al., and Zhou et al. And the main idea behind this paper is to relate wide enough neural networks to a kernel. And J. Cote et al. has shown that as one increases the width of a neural network to infinity, a certain limiting behavior called neural tangent kernel will emerge. So our paper focuses on studying neural tangent kernels. So there are many questions that remain to be studied for neural tangent kernels. The first question is that can we formally show that the prediction of neural networks is equivalent that to neural tangent kernels when the, when the width of the neural network is sufficiently large. And the second question is that how does neural tangent kernel perform on standard benchmarks for deep learning like CFR10? So we answer these questions in this paper. Our first contribution is a theoretical contribution. So what we show is that when the width of the neural network is sufficiently large, the predictor learned by applying gradient descent on a neural network is close to the kernel regression predictor or, or the corresponding neural tangent kernel. So here, by sufficient large, I mean the width is polynomial in the number of data points in the depths and in the inverse of the target accuracy epsilon. So this is the first theoretical uh, guarantee that relates wide neural networks to uh, neural tangent kernels. And our second contribution is an experimental contribution. So basically, we gave a dynamical programming-based algorithm for calculating neural tangent kernels for convolutional neural networks together with GPU implementations so that we can run the experiments on, CFR10, on the whole CFR10 data set. So here, we give the test accuracy of various uh, algorithms on CFR10. The first column is the depth of the CN or the corresponding neural tangent kernel. The second column is the performance of vanilla CNN without using uh, techniques like batch normalization and the learning rate decay. The third column is the test accuracy of the neural tangent kernel corresponds to CNNs. The, third, uh, the fourth column is the performance of convolutional neural networks with global average pooling. And the last column is the uh, uh, test accuracy of neural tangent kernel corresponds to CNN with global average pooling. So there are two observations here. The first one is that the performance of neural tangent kernels is highly correlated with the performance of the corresponding CNN. So this means that uh, in order to study CNN, we, maybe we can just look at the corresponding NTK and study the property of the corresponding NTK. So one specific reason that makes this possible is like, as we can see, as we use better architecture for CNN, the performance of the neural tangent kernel is also getting better. The second observation is that there is still a gap between the performance between neural net, uh, convolutional neural networks and that of the uh, neural tangent kernel. So this means that the success of deep learning may not be uh, fully explained by uh, neural tangent kernels. OK, let me list two uh, interesting future directions. So first, as we show in our experiments, the performance of neural tangent kernel and neural networks is highly correlated. So can we understand the design of neural network architectures and other techniques in deep learning, like batch normalization and residual layers, using the lens of neural tangent kernel? And the second question is, like, can we combine neural tangent kernel with other previous techniques in kernel methods to further improve the, the overall performance of kernel methods? Okay, so uh, let me conclude the talk, and uh, so you can find the full paper, our full paper on archive, and we have also released the code for calculating convolutional neural tangent kernels on GitHub. And welcome to the post session this morning for our paper. And again, thanks for coming to my talk. <laughs>
Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Yuan Cao from UCLA. My topic today is generalization bounds for stochastic gradient descent for wide and deep neural networks. This is a joint work with Professor Chen Chen Gu. So a recent line of work has observed that uh, extremely wide deep neural networks can always be trained to achieve zero training error, uh, regardless of uh, how the labels are generated. Mm. On the other hand, the test error of neural networks can sometimes be small, sometimes be large, depending on the labeling of the data. For example, if the labels are purely random, then obviously generalization is impossible. Based on this observation, we aim to answer the following two questions. Why can extremely wide neural networks generalize? And what data can be learned by deep and wide neural networks? So we consider fully connected ReLU networks. Here M is the number of hidden neurons per layer. And we use stochastic gradient descent starting at Gaussian initialization to minimize the cross entropy loss. Here is our first theoretical result. We show that as long as the neural network is wide enough, the networks can compete with the best function in the function class F defined below the theorem. So this function class F is essentially defined as a linear combination of network gradients at initialization. And therefore, it can be considered as a random feature model, which we call the neural tangent random feature model. This theorem also leads to the following corollary as a special case, which connects the neural networks with the neural tangent kernel function proposed by Jacob et al. last year. So here in the, first time, in the first term of the bound, the y is an n-dimensional vector of labels, and the theta is an n by n matrix, which is a grand matrix of the neural tangent kernel function. Our result uh, sh explains what kind of data neural networks can learn and shows that the classifiability of the data can be measured by a quantity related to the term y transpose theta inverse y. For example, if the labels y are purely random, then it can be shown that the term y transpose theta inverse y can be much larger than n, and therefore the first term in our generalization bound can be much larger than 1. This matches our intuition that purely random labels cannot be learned with good initialization. On the other hand, if the term y transpose theta inverse y can be bounded by a constant, then our result implies that the test error of neural networks follows the standard statistical rate. All right, so here is the overview of the proof. So our proof is based on the key observation that deep ReLU networks are almost linear in terms of the parameters in a neighborhood around initialization. So based on that, we can also show that the objective function in terms of parameters is Lipschitz continuous and almost convex. And therefore, we can implement a standard convex optimization analysis as well as the online to batch conversion technique to prove our result. So our proof framework can be applicable to general loss functions because as long as the loss function itself is convex, Lipschitz, or smooth, our analysis shows that the corresponding objective function in terms of parameters is also almost convex, Lipschitz, or smooth. So in summary, we established two generalization bounds for wide and deep neural networks. The first bound is in terms of the neural tangent random feature model. The other one is in terms of the neural tangent kernel. Our generalization bound does not increase in terms of the network width, which means that they can always provide meaningful bounds, even for extremely wide neural networks. So we give a quantification of the classifiability of the data, and we provide a clean proof framework that is applicable to more general problem settings. Thank you. Our poster number is 141. Hope to see you there. Hi, everybody. My name is Alex Roby, and today I'm going to present a little bit of recent work that I've been involved with, with authors at Penn, on efficiently and accurately computing the Lipschitz constants of deep neural networks. So first question is, what is a Lipschitz constant? So intuitively, a small Lipschitz constant means that if I have two points, x and y, at the endpoint of a neural network, then they'll still be close when I pass them to the output of the neural network. Now, why do we care about this Lipschitz constant? We, pair, we care because it has a number of important applications in machine learning, including in generalization bounds and in robust classification. 
Now, unfortunately, this problem of exactly computing the Lipschitz constant is NP-hard, which motivates us to find ways to efficiently and accurately provide tight upper bounds to the Lipschitz constant. So let me illustrate this problem on a standard robust classification task. Let's say for the moment that we have an accurate upper bound for the Lipschitz constant of this neural network. Now we could take a point f of x in the codomain. We could measure the distance delta to misclassification. And then we could connect this number delta back to the input of the neural network. That is, for this nominal point x, we could draw a small epsilon ball around x where epsilon depends only or is proportional to 1 over the Lipschitz constant. And we could certify that if we, per if we perturb x within this small ball, then the classification of x won't change under the mapping of the neural network. So the high level message here is that if we can certify that a network has a small Lipschitz constant, uh, this will directly imply that the network has, in some sense, more robustness. So how do we go about estimating this Lipschitz constant? It turns out that there are a couple of simple things that we could try. So perhaps the most simple thing would just be to take the product of the norms of the weight matrices, and this gives us one upper bound on this Lipschitz constant of neural networks. Now, unfortunately, it turns out that simple methods like this one give us upper bounds to the Lipschitz constant that are very conservative. And this motivates us to think if we can do anything more accurate. In our paper, our first step is to formulate this problem of exactly computing the Lipschitz constant as a highly non-convex optimization program. We then use a convex relaxation to write this program uh, as a convex program that's easily solvable, and that gives us an upper bound to the Lipschitz constant. More specifically, our idea is to over-approximate the hidden layers of a neural network via incremental quadratic constraints, or IQCs, which are a powerful tool from convex optimization. These IQCs, these constraints, give rise to a semi-definite program, the optimum value of which gives us a tight upper bound to the Lipschitz constant of a neural network. And I should say that in our paper, we actually propose several variants of this semi-definite program that allow a user to trade off scalability with accuracy of the bound. <laughs> And so now that we have this way of computing the Lipschitz constant, the natural next question is, how does this bound that we can get compared to other bounds in the literature? So in our experiments, we show that, um, in general, our bound is much tighter than other bounds, uh, such as the naive upper bound that I presented earlier, and other ways of computing this Lipschitz constant. And now, returning to this robust classification example that I presented earlier, um, in our paper, we took kind of a close look at adversarial robustness. In particular, we were interested in the hypothesis that neural networks trained using adversarial training schemes have lower Lipschitz constants than neural networks trained with, say, your standard atom optimizer. And empirically, at least, uh, we found that when we evaluate the Lipschitz constant of these neural networks, networks trained with robust algorithms generally have much lower Lipschitz constants than those trained without them. So if you take away one thing from this talk, it should be that we have an accurate and scalable way of efficiently computing the Lipschitz constant of neural networks. Again, my name is Alex Roby. Uh, I'll be around all of today at our poster, which is in the other building, number 139. And I'd be happy to talk to you or take any questions you might have. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Colin Wei, and I'm going to talk about the regularization effect of a large initial learning rate. This is joint work with Renzi Lee at CMU and Tung Yi Ma at Stanford. So um, it's been observed in deep learning that having a large initial learning rate is crucial for good generalization. A commonly used learning rate schedule is to first start with a large learning rate and then anneal by a constant factor at a certain epoch. And if you have a small learning rate, it turns out that you can get better train and test performance up until the point in which you anneal. So if you look at the red curve over there, it eclipses the blue up until the gray line, which is where um, you anneal. And afterwards, the blue has better test accuracy. And so our work is um, trying to explain why this happens. So the explanation that we pose is that 
the learning rate schedule changes the order of learning different patterns in the data, which influences the generalization of your network. So um, what I mean by this is that the small learning rate will quickly memorize hard to fit class signatures in the data, or watermarks, which basically indicate what the class is. Um, but it will ignore other patterns in the data, which harms generalization. On the other hand, the large learning rate will uh, first learn the easy to fit patterns, and then it will only memorize the hard to fit patterns after you anneal, which means it will learn to use all the patterns, which helps generalization. So if this quick explanation didn't make much sense, um, you should check out our poster, because it's a relatively complicated um, to explain concept. So, but the intuition is that the larger learning rate will have larger noises in the activations, uh, which effectively weakens the representational power and prevents it from overfitting to uh, quote unquote class signatures. And the non-convexity here is crucial because different learning rate schedules, uh, if you're a non-convex problem, they'll find different solutions. And so we can demonstrate more concretely how this works on the modified CIFAR-10 data set. So we artificially modify the data set to have three groups of examples representing the different pattern types. So the first group of examples will be 20% of the total examples, and these will be um, hard to generalize but easy to fit patterns. And this will be the original image. So um, the, it's hard to generalize because of variations in the image, but it's, it's easier to fit than the second group of examples, which will be 20% of the total examples. And these will be easy to generalize but hard to fit patterns. And it'll be hard to fit by construction. Um, and basically, we construct it to be a patch which indicates what the class is. And finally, there's a third group of examples, which is 60% of the total examples. And we construct this by just overlaying the patch on top of the image. So what will happen in practice is that uh, if you have a small learning rate, you'll quickly memorize the patch. But because you memorize the patch so fast, you ignore the rest of the original image in the third group of examples, which contains both. And so you'll only learn the original image from the 20% of total examples in group one. And on the other hand, if you have a large initial learning rate, you'll initially ignore the patch. So you'll actually uh, learn from the original image. And so you'll learn this original image from 80% of the total examples in um, groups one and groups three combined. And then you'll learn the patch after you anneal. And so you effectively learn the image with more samples. And so you'll get better generalization. And so uh, we can construct a theoretical setting where this provably happens. So we again have the same three examples. Um, the first class of examples will be uh, linearly classifiable patterns this time. And because they're high dimensional, they'll be hard to generalize. The second group will be uh, examples that are clustered but not linearly separable. Since they're clustered, the sample complexity will be constant. And finally, the third group will contain both patterns. And um, in this setting, we prove that the same uh, phenomenon happens. And so in conclusion, a, large le a small learning rate will optimize faster, but it'll generalize worse than the large initial learning rate and annealing. And the, our explanation for this is the order of learning different patterns in the data. Um, so we identify the two types of patterns. And um, the, the key mechanism for this regularization is the SGD noise from having a large learning rate. And if you're interested in learning more, come check out our poster. Our poster number is 144. Thank you. Hello again. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, for those of you who missed the previous talk, I'm Colin. I'm going to talk about data-dependent sample complexities for deep neural networks. And this is joint work with Tung Yu Ma at Stanford. Uh, so our motivating question here is, how do we design principled regularizers for deep learning models? So currently, uh, a lot of the techniques used to help generalization are designed in an ad hoc manner. For example, batch norm and dropout, we know that they work, but we don't really know why they work. Um, so one potential approach that's more principled is to first theoretically prove an upper bound on the generalization error, and then um, empirically regularize this bound and hope that improves your performance. And so there's a bottleneck with this approach in prior work, which is that uh, <coughs> the prior bounds can be loose and might not depend on the most meaningful quantity, so it's not clear whether regularizing them will help generalization. For example, most prior works consider only the norms, the norms of the weight matrices. And because of this, they get uh, pessimistic bounds 
that can be exponential in the depth. Um, so in our work, we consider generalization bounds that depend on more data-dependent properties than just the norm of the weight matrices. So specifically, we want to prove that generalization is upper bounded by some function of the weights and the training data. And um, we will add this function to the loss as an explicit regularizer. So the informal theorem that we show is that the generalization can be upper bounded by the product of the Jacobian norm times the hidden layer norm divided by the margin uh, times the square root of the training set size plus some lower order terms. And um, the quantities in this bound, um, so first the Jacobian norm is the max norm of, the, of a Jacobian of the model with respect to hidden layers on the training data. Uh, the hidden layer norm is the max norm of a hidden activation layer on the training data. And the margin is the largest logit of the output minus the second largest logit, and you take the minimum over the training data. And um, so our, the interpretation of our bound is that it measures the stability or lipschiousness of the network around the training examples. And the key point is that it, you only need to look at the stability on the training examples, uh, because if you look at the worst case stability over all inputs, you basically get this exponential depend depth dependency that's, um, that prior work suffers from. And so uh, this notion of stability is also studied in work by Aurora et al. in 2019 and Nagarajan and Coulter in 2019. Um, and they show that this stability is pretty small in practice, so much smaller than worst case. And they also uh, obtain bounds. So the final ingredient for uh, deriving a regularizer is to actually regularize the bound. And so the way we try to do this for our bound is to we penalize the square Jacobian norm in the loss. Um, and then to control the hidden layer norm, which also appears in our bound, we have normalization layers such as batch norm and layer norm. And uh, we find that this method helps in a variety of settings which lack regularization compared to the baseline. So if you have a low learning rate or no data augmentation or no batch norm. And finally, we can check that our bound correlates with the test error. So we plot our bound in red versus um, some bound based on the weight matrix norms in blue. And um, we plot this for three different models, one with trained with batch norm, one with fix up, um, which is a method meant to replace batch norm, and one without batch norm. And we find that um, norm-based bound doesn't correlate that well with test error, but ours does. And so to conclude, uh, we obtain tighter generalization bounds by con considering data-dependent properties, such as the stability of the network around the training data. And our bound will avoid the exponential dependencies on the depth of the network. And we find that optimizing this bound will improve performance in practice. And we also have follow-up work um, that obtains tighter bounds and uh, also empirical improvement over strong baselines, and we obtain improvement for both robust and clean accuracy. And uh, you can check out the work in the title listed on the slide. And if you're interested in learning more, come find our poster number 220. Thank you. This concludes the session. Thank you for attending, and please enjoy the conference. Thank you.